to another episode of the Redeemed Man Podcast. My name is Nathan Dewberry. I'm the director of the Redeemed. And today I have a special guest with me, Pastor of Live, of Live Atlanta, Mayo Sowell. Welcome to the show, Mayo. Thank you so much for having me, man. I really you know, respect you guys' ministry. And uh, it's amazing. So thank you so much for having me, Nathan. Look forward to hanging out with you for a few moments. Excited about it. As we start every show, we always ask, uh, what does redemption mean to you? And so, uh, Mayo, I'd love to hear uh, in your own personal perspective on redemption. Yeah, um, I mean, that's that's a great question. As I watch you guys, you know, just, you know, previous segments, you know, you don't throw people off by that, but you get such a <laughs> personal, I mean, yeah. I would say a God journey answer to it. You know, you don't get a theological answer. Although it does come from a theological uh, framework, you know, but for me, you know, you know, some say a uh, re is the most beautiful prefix in the Bible. You know, I, I've, I've seen some scholars, they write that about, you know, renewed and just, you know, uh, regenerating and rewatch and repent and recall and reclaim. But for me, that word redeem is really so important because. For me, I was at my worst time and God like came to me in my worst time and he bought me back with his blood. Like he bought me back with his love. And, you know, it was just a, a purchase, of course, that he paid, paid for on the cross. But when it became personal for me at my darkest time, I was like, man, he paid a price for me, even though I wasn't willing to believe that price. And that was that. That was my story, you know. And it's it so it's so important to me, and it's so like um, so real, you know. My my hurt in the middle of my pain, not knowing what I was going to do next, not knowing even if I was going to do right, you know. I experienced the love of God, and that's when I experienced redemption. Love it. Uh, I can definitely relate to that. Speaking of your your own story of redemption and that place of brokenness, can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you grew up, uh, your family, and uh, really your journey to where you are today? Obviously, we know you are a pastor, just planted a church in Atlanta, and uh, just kind of how did you get to that place? Uh, I know it's been a long journey. There's a lot along the way and we'll yeah. pull out at different times, but just kind of a little bit of your own background. Yeah, just a you know, snapshot of it. Um, Nathan, you know, I started off, I was born in LA and my parents moved from LA to Louisiana and we grew up in Louisiana. So it was just, that was culture shock. LA, Louisiana. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, some, some like both of them are LA, you know, <laughs> but they're totally different. <laughs> very different. Oh, very different. My gosh, very different. And then inside of LA, it's not like we moved to Louisiana. It's not like we moved to New Orleans or Baton Rouge. We moved to Nagatish, Nagatish, N-A-T-C-H-I-T-O-C-H-E-S, Nagatish, like the the other towns with Zuwali, Provincial, Kasachi. Like, it was just like, I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> so it was crazy. So uh, I kind of uh, grew up down there, you know, um, and then my parents were struggling, you know, we didn't, I didn't, you know, we didn't have a relationship with Jesus at the time. And my parents end up getting a divorce and my mom ended up moving to Birmingham and I ended up moving to Birmingham with my mom. And that's when uh, my mom was working three jobs at the time, just trying to provide for us. And I used to go to the library after school every day because my mom said, you can't go home, so go to the library and just read books. I'm like, what do you mean read books? Mom, I'm, not, I'm not going to the library. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to the library, but I'm just not going to read no books. And the library was in a community center and it had a gym in it and i used to go in there and play basketball with these guys right here in homewood alabama i mean i'm in atlanta now in homewood alabama and i used to go play basketball with all these little white kids and we was like 13 14 and i was the only black kid in there and there's this guy named will gardner and he's like hey man you should really try to play basketball now i never played sports so he's like you should really try to play basketball i'm like nah, man you know, I don't. And his dad was a coach dick gardner so so he started to coach me and I started to fall in love with basketball. And that was my entry into athletics. And you fast forward to tape, I progressed in basketball, but all of a sudden people wanted me to try football. So I got good at football. And then I ended up getting a scholarship to Auburn University, going to play football at Auburn. And after I played football at Auburn, I went to Buffalo Bills, 
and I tore my ACL. I was living right here in Atlanta. And I had this bright idea. Well, if I can't maintain the type of lifestyle that I want playing football, I just sell drugs. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, it's a lot of ideas you should get before you get to the idea of selling drugs. That was, <laughs> like, that was the idea, you know, like, because, you know, in Atlanta, in some environments, you know, the, the, the drug guy, the street guy, the black market guy, the guy that's doing negative and the guy that's yeah. making this um, uh, ultimate hustle, he was kind of glorified. So I was like, man, I kind of like the guy. He was like literally on the same status level with the rapper and the athlete. It was the drug dealer. It was the, it was the trifecta. Like, you can be one of them. You were the man in Atlanta. So I was like, well, can't play basketball. Can't play football no more. Definitely can't rap. <laughs> I was going to sell drugs. So man, I did that. You know, I did that, Nathan, for seven years, man. And um, end up doing a deal down in Arizona. And come to find out, I was doing a deal with our federal government. And, you know, a few hours later, I was in a cell, and they said, Mayo, so well, you're, verse, you're facing a minimum of 15 years to life. We've been watching you. So now, man, I was like, wow, this is not good. I ended up doing five years of prison because I was a first-time offender, and I graduated from college. The judge said, you know, for some reason, Mayo, he said this when he sentenced me for five years because he went under the 15 years mandatory minimum. And he said, I'm not going to give you 15 years, which is your mandatory minimum. But for some reason, I think you're going to get it right. No, he told me. Now, in my mind, at that time, Nathan, I had, I'm like, whatever. I'm not going to get it right, bro. I'm going to go out. I'm going to do better. I see how y'all caught me this time, so I'm going to do better next time. <laughs> like, literally, I'm, like, strategizing, making better connections in, in jail and everything, like, getting mentors. Like, it was like, it was, it was like that. So I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, lo and behold, my fourth year of prison, a guy came up to me. And he said, can I pray for you? And he prayed for me. Everything, cold turkey. No, everything. Everything, cold turkey. From language to actions that I was doing as a man that I shouldn't have been doing. Addiction. Like, the things that I acquired in the world that I still had in Atlanta. I had two restaurants. Yeah. I had three houses. I had cars. I had money. I had people still working for me while I was in. I didn't want to touch it. So I went back to the guy. I was like, hey, what did you do to me? <laughs> no, because I was angry. Because I wanted my desires. I was in jail. Yeah. I, I enjoyed my desires. Yeah. Okay, that's all I yeah. had. Like, I was in jail. So I'm yeah. like, what did you do? And he was like, that's, that's the love of God. And when I go, when you ask me the question of redeemed, that's when I met the thing that purchased me personally, which was the love of God. And man, my life just changed. I, I said, what do I do now? He said, you need to start reading the word. So he pushed me in the Bible and I just dived into the Bible and I started to see the love of God, what I experienced personally. I started to see it through scripture. When I started to see it through scripture, I started to say, well, I have a lot of lost friends that need to experience the same thing. Yeah. So uh, exit out of prison year five. I didn't want to go back to Atlanta because I didn't think it was time yet. I thought I would, you know, just return to the streets. So I said, Mom, can I come back to Birmingham? And my mom said, yes, you can come back to Birmingham. And the only church that was within a five-mile radius that I can go to in Birmingham was Church of the Highlands. I walked into that church. I experienced the love of God again. And I said, this will be my church forever. Eight years later, God spoke to me. After Pastor Chris hired me on that staff, God spoke. He said, hey, Mayo, um, you died in a city, and they seen you die. Now it's time for them to see you live. And that was the birth of living land. So I'm sure every day you're reminded of that redemption with the fact you're back in every Atlanta. Day. No, every, every day I walk outside, I breathe the air. Man, it's living now. But it was death every day. Every time my friends see me, they can't believe it. They see my family and they see the church and they come to the church and they be like, we was selling drugs together. <laughs> <laughs> no, they literally say that. They like, yo, bro. You're not hustling no more? I'm like, my husband's like, you really doing this? And people come up to me and they like, pass the mail. And they're like, and then bro, they be so confused. And they sit in church and they don't know what to do with their hands. And they like, they, they don't know where to hold a gun or just put their hands up and like, they don't know what to do. 
<laughs> then they like, hey, can I give? And they like, they have money. And they like, can I give? I'm like, bro, this, hey, God's going to speak to you. You just be obedient to God. What do you mean he's going to speak? What are you going to say? I'm like, just listen. <laughs> it, though, it is the funniest thing ever, man. <laughs> it's like, what, what, what are these white people here for? I'm like, bro, they're here. <laughs> you no, know, it's, it's a mess. It's like, it's like, bro, they're here because they, they love God and they love you. They don't know me. Trust me, they love you. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. But let's live in Atlanta. Man, that is such a powerful story. And I think one of the things we've been talking about in the last few episodes is just overcoming yeah. life's tragedies. And a lot of times the tragedies are of our own making. Yeah. I mean, it, at the end of the day, we have tragedies that happen to us that are way beyond our control. And then we have those situations that we step into and God redeems them for good. And your story is, is, is a lot of that. Um, uh, that restoration and and giving you immeasurably more than what you ever dreamed you could have because of God's goodness and grace and and lifting you up. Um, when I think about that and I think about your background and those pivotal moments, how has it been? You know, you said you didn't have those desires anymore. Yeah. Has there been moments of doubt after you have? stepped out of prison, given your life to Christ, began to follow him. What challenges have you faced since then? Because I know, you know, <laughs> yes, life has been changed and transformed, but it's not perfect. Yeah. Um, the gospel, it's like the gospel has a string attached to doubt. Damn. Like, like the gospel is this, it's this little thing that moves in what's attached to it is doubt because in, 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 and it has to be attached to it because he wouldn't tell you to believe if believe was super impossible super possible. So it's so good. It's going to make you doubt, but then you got to believe. And then it's so good. It's going to make you doubt, but then you got to believe. It's so good, it's going to make you doubt. And I look at my life, and it's like, it's so good. And I start to doubt, and then I got to believe. That's yeah. the good news. And that's, that's every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. I have to train myself to receive the good news. Life is good. And I, t I try to tell myself that every day. Life is good. Life is good. Although something bad may happen, life is good. 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 And this is that that's been the biggest temptation for me. You know, that's that's been I would say that's been the hardest uh trial that I've experienced because life has been so good. Mayo, you mentioned coming to know Christ in um prison. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that encounter and and what that guy shared with you? You mentioned, you know, being completely changed in that moment. Yeah. But tell us a little bit more about that experience and how you began to grow after that. Um, you know, um, in the Bible, it talks about God takes the foolish things to confound the wise. You know, it talks, you know, in uh, first Corinthians, it talks about that. And, you know, the, the way, you know, it was so, it was so unorthodox the way that God reached me, <laughs> you know, uh, because in, in prison, you know, racial lines, you really don't cross them. You know, yeah. black is with blacks, brown is with brown. White is, <coughs> excuse me, white is with white. So in this, uh, this is one guy who was outside on the compound. And the compound is like the courtyard. Everyone is, you know, just, that's where everyone, they congregate in the courtyard. So you, you, got, your, you got your things over there, things over there. And it's just, every, it's, it's everything. It's prison. Don't, take my word for it. Don't go and find out, maybe. <laughs> take my word for it. Okay. All right. So, um, and this guy started walking up to me. And at that time, man, I was like, I practiced Islam, like the nation of Islam. Like I was like, because it was this, you know, it was this, this, um, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was bad. I was, it was, it was horrible. We'll talk about it another day. Um, and this guy began to walk towards me, this white guy. And everybody's watching, like, what is about to happen? So you could tell, you could tell everybody is kind of getting ready and they picking out their, you know, route of travel and if they're going to run, if they're going to yeah. fight, what's going to happen? Everybody's watching. This guy said, can I pray for you? And he reached and he prayed for me, laid his hands on me. This guy was oh, we're tuning. This is a white guy. And from there on, he loved me and he mentored me and he taught me the Bible. And everybody was like, 
That's odd. Those two guys, they're together now. Yeah, Howard really, you know, began to mentor me because he loved me, you know, despite of what I was doing. And that love just overtook me and it just, man, it just poured in my life. And it's, I'm living a byproduct of it now. And then an awesome picture, though, of, of how the faith crosses all lines. Yes. You yeah, know, all when lines. we... It's, it breaks down those barriers that we set up ourselves and and we tend to get behind. And yet the gospel tears down those barriers. It tears them down. That's good. Yeah. Wow. So how have you seen that the gospel transform not only you, but your family? Because I know uh, when you were back in Atlanta, there was uh, you were living with your family. So what was that process like? And, and how have you seen the gospel impact them as well in, in the life that you're living? Well, my my parents, they wasn't involved in church, and they started going to church at home. So now my dad and mom, they sit on the second row every Sunday. They're like, Pastor Chris is the biggest cheerleaders. I mean, it. I mean, the gospel is like, you know how Jesus said, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like a little leaven. And it, once you put it in, it leavens the whole, you know, and that, that was my life. You know, he, he put it in there. He put us in his church. And now our whole life, you know, my sisters, my brother, you know, my life, my three kids, you know, people in Atlanta. It just kept growing, you know, because uh, it's the good news. And Jesus is doing such a miracle, not only in their life today, they're actually, well, I'm actually coming over here this weekend and they're contemplating moving over here to help us plant the church. But right. it's just, you know, my dad used to drink. Now he's not drinking anymore. Their marriage used to be like just destroyed. Now they're together and they love each other and they're leading small groups. My dad going to prison and lead freedom. My mom leads workout groups like they're like on the dream team. They're, I mean, they're running the play. They're living Love it. the best of their life this late in their life right now. Also, I know, I know you, your wife, Kai, and you guys are quite the power couple. So tell us a little bit about how you guys met and your story, because I, I know you have two kids as well, right? Yeah. Uh, Three kids. And, Three kids, yeah. Yeah, what, no, um, she don't act like a kid. She just stays. In my life. <laughs> she stays in my wife home. She need to pay some bills. <laughs> Liberty. Um. So yeah. So Kai, you know, Kai's from Philly, and Kai and I met. We met in a nightclub in Atlanta. And when I went to prison, Kai wrote me a letter, and she said, "Hey, you're not damaged goods. If you need a friend, I'm here." And she started to visit me in Atlanta, and she visit she visited me, even though I, even while I was lost, she visited me. When I gave my life to Jesus. At that time, she was started going to church, and she started to give her life to Jesus also. And we went on this journey, and I can't when I exited out of prison and went back to Birmingham, I asked Kai to marry me. So she moved to Birmingham. So now she got involved with Church of Highlands, but the Highlands College was on staff at Church of Highlands with our central offices. And, um, and man, we just we said, hey, we're going to do this the rest of our life together. We experience Jesus together. We're going to do it the rest of our life together and try to help as many people experience him as possible. Fast forward to say, looking back, three years, I mean, several years later, we had three kids, and all three kids love Jesus. Cannon, he, I mean, Cannon, you know, that's all, he, you know, if he tells me to do something, hey, Cannon, I can, I can bench press this. Well, Jesus can bench press more. I'm like, bro, I'm not trying to compete with Jesus, okay? You know, so, you know, they love Jesus, and they're having the greatest time, and I mean, she's, her, her family up north, they look at her, and they're like, oh my goodness, you're different. Like, she's really different to her parents. They don't know like what to say, you know, all her friends and stuff up north that still needs Jesus. They are blown away at Kai's transformation. That's amazing to hear what God's done in both of your life and how it's been a journey together. Uh, as you guys are planning this church in Atlanta, can you tell me a little bit about the vision of Live Atlanta and how God's put that on your heart? Yeah. So the vision of the Atlanta is very, very, very similar to uh, Church of Highlands. You know, if any of you guys are familiar with Church of Highlands, that's, that's tuning in. So Pastor Chris, all I know is what he's taught me, because that's where I started. I started, I was a white sheet of paper, and he drew on me, and he decided me and mentored me. So in Atlanta, we, you know, our mission is to flourish all people of Atlanta. You know, the all is very polarizing because some people don't think all people deserve to have Christ. Because yeah. they might be doing yeah. something, they might look like something, they might have not have something. But we want to flourish all people of Atlanta. And the way we do that is by helping them know God, find freedom, couple purpose, make a difference. That right there is our vision. Our mission is flourishing all people. And we have really four segments that we lean into, which, uh, which you know, 
which helps us kind of identify where those people sit in our eyes. And it's culture, it's the community, it's the corporations, and it is the um, culture, community, corporations, and it's the churches. Because it's a lot of people in Atlanta that's de church to steal. Yeah. That yeah. have not went back. So we're called to reach that segment of people. And if you look at all four things that we do, meaning it's four of them, it's the culture, the communities, the corporation and the churches, and it is no God, discover purpose, make a difference. In that is a palm tree. In that square right there is a palm tree. And that's where our theme verse comes out of Psalms 92. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. And that is also our acronym for live. Love, integrity, influence, victory. And so it's just this house that's kind of short to you. This house is kind of created right here. And that's you in the middle of that house. While you're on the journey of knowing God, finding freedom, discovering purpose, making a difference, you're flourishing. Love if it. you continue to love God, use your integrity wisely, use your influence to help others up and push them forward, making a difference in other life, you will experience the victory of Jesus Christ. And you will flourish. We're called to the corporations, called to the communities, called to the churches, and we're also called to the culture of Atlanta. Because we wanted to flourish. That's our common cause. So in that, all people hopefully will flourish right here in the city of Atlanta. And we'll be a part of it. And God, you know, will uh, just get all the honor. Get all the honor. I could not think of a better pastor and, and team to be leading that with just how much you guys are a picture of what it means to flourish in God. And on strength and hope and redemption and restoration and that picture of a life that's completely different than what what could have been your life. God came in and scripted a whole different story. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. Man. Yeah, it's been it's been a journey and it's been a fun journey. So, if, as you think back into what you were going through, if there's anybody listening that maybe they're in the middle of something going on in their life that they think they cannot overcome or get out of, um, what would you say to them? Well, I would say uh, to them, first of all, they can get out of it and they can overcome it. Although it may be hard, you know, although it may look overcomable, although it may look, you know, very, you know, uh, like a trap situation. Um, I would ask them to, Lean into the most positive person that you know in your life. God has placed a light in your life and he's probably speaking to you right now and bringing to your mind that person. Yeah. I would say lean into that person. Text that person, say, hey, can we get coffee? You know, text that person, say, hey, can we take a walk on the track? Text that person, say, hey, can, you know, I just come over. Whatever it is, get near, near that person because that is the light that God has put in your life. I know it. I know it. I know it. Everything in me. God places light in everyone's life. So lean into that person. Open up to that person. And I guarantee you, you will get one step closer to the freedom that you're looking for, the deliverance that you're looking for, the answer that you may need, the hope that you may need to feel, the healing that you may need to be co to cover your hurt. But just lean into that one person. God works through people. That's his economy. You know, he's, an, he's invisible. God is invisible. But to experience his visible attributes, you have to run into a person of God. So just lean into them. And, and I guarantee you, he will respond through them for you. Guarantee you. Good, that's my good word, Mayo. That's my story. Yeah. No, that's, and that's, that's good. Um, as you think about the people that have made that difference in your life and the community around you, what do you do today to continue to maintain healthy relationships? Obviously, you're a pastor. Yeah. And so people have you and and on a pedestal, or at least mm -hmm. some people do when mm -hmm. they look at you because of your position. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain that vulnerability with other men in your life to protect yourself? Because at the end of the day, you're, you're a target. The enemy would love to, to take you out as a leader uh, of the faith of somebody who has been changed and transformed. Uh, what do you do to develop that community? Because obviously the heartbeat of the redeemed is to make sure that men get around other men and take right. off their mask and they're vulnerable and they're sharing that. We provide that safe space because we know that we're better together. But that's a consistent, constant uh, thing that we have to train ourselves in. Yeah. 
So what I what I would say is, and I would you know first talk to the men that's on the line. For me, I watch all. I watch three things. I watch three categories, and I'm and I'm very particular on how I watch these three categories. And I kind of like lean into everything else and just be free with everything else. So these are my three categories that I would love to give men. The first thing I watch is females. I watch females. Whether you know you, you're listening in, you know, brother, whether you're married or not. You need to watch females. Watch them, watch them, watch them, watch them. Think about what you're thinking about in terms of females. You know, for you, for guys that's married, you know, everything is online for me, meaning everything is no private space for me. I don't have a private Instagram account. I don't have a private passcode on my phone. I don't have a private email. My wife, everything is public to my wife because I want to maintain a high level of integrity in terms of females. I don't mentor a female. I don't pastor a female one-on-one. The, the, the bare minimum that I do, I will have a conversation with a female. She called me because she's going through something because I, I have to pass it. But I will tell my wife. So I always, always, always try to maintain a lifestyle of integrity in terms of females. So even if you're single, guys, hey, still maintain the lifestyle of integrity around females. You know, watch how you be intoxicated around females. Watch how much you drink around females. Watch what you take from a female. Watch how you lead a female. Watch what you say. Like, just females, females, females. Like, we really have to go up around that. Second thing is profit, profit. I make sure I don't fall prey to profit, meaning I don't use my platform as a profit. I don't use my spiritual gifts as a profit. I try to make sure that the enemy has no hooks in me in terms of profit and finance and resources. I give all that to God. I give all that to God. God is going to provide for me. I lean into him. I work hard in everything I do, but I don't work hard in everything I do for profit. Because the Bible says in all things you do, do it as if you are pleasing the Lord. So I work hard in everything I do. Although my hard work yields a profit, I don't focus on the profit to yield you, you, I don't focus on hard work to yield a profit. So profits. And the last thing is pride. Because now everything's going to work. Because you have females at distance. You're handling that, which is the number one thing we see in scripture. And we see it in culture that takes a leader down, yeah. which is a man. Yeah. A female. The enemy uses temptation and he uses the man eyes to want something and covet something that he should not even have. Yeah. So that's in order. Now my finances, the enemy has no hook in me. And I'm not trying to gain wealth. I'm doing good because I should do good. Right. The third thing that's trying to come in is pride. And now we get to your question. Nathan. For me, what helps me build resilience against pride is be authentic and transparent with other men. Because what they want to do is they want to push me up. And the higher, higher, higher you go the more chance you don't want to be authentic and vulnerable. Yeah. So now I go low as I can. I was in a small group last night with some guys and I was telling them some guys, Hey guys, there's some things I need to surrender in my life to God. And they looking at me like, Hey, you the pastor. This is, <laughs> this is, this is your, like, this is your event. And I'm like, no yeah. matter of fact, let's everybody say some things that we need to surrender to God. If I'm going to sit here and unclothe myself in front of you guys, mm-hmm. let's all do it. Yeah. And we were yeah. around the table and we did it. But those three things, which the last one is pride, I go low as I can with the action of humility, transparent, and vulnerability. Low as I can. Low as I can. Low, like, I'm, yeah, I'm 6'2", 230 pounds, guys. <laughs> Listen, I need you to pray for me. Well, what do you mean? You can take care of yourself. No, I can't. Yeah. So that, that's just, that's for me, and that served me well. And I'm going to teach my son that. I really believe in that. I really believe in it. Mayo, thank you for that. I think sometimes when you hear somebody's story, we miss the practical of that. Yeah. We can miss the things that we do to guard and protect ourselves daily. And I really appreciate you being open about what you do as a pastor and as a leader, as a father, as a, as a spouse, because all that really plays into, hey, you, you don't want to lose the the position or the authority you have given you or the church. But at the end of the day, you do it for your family and you do it for yourself. And I think that's something that a lot of people forget. It is really for yourself as well. Like there, there is something to walk in that freedom and to experience to be a person of integrity. Yeah. Because when you are divided, there's no peace there. It's no peace. It's no peace at all. Because you, that's what James says. James say a double mind man's unstable in all his ways. Yeah. No, he says all. Oh, he don't say so. And that's like very polarizing, James. <laughs> like all. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, Let's just be singular.
Well, thank you, Mayo. Thank you for sharing your story of redemption. Thank you for giving us some practical tools that we can use. Uh, I'd love to get uh, a, just a little bit of fun. We always try to do this because we our podcast is pretty heavy at times, so we want to do some fun questions for you. These, are, if you'll just answer, uh, we'll roll through these pretty quick. Uh, uh, your favorite verse? Favorite verse? Uh, man, that's a good one. That's that's a great one. Probably, uh, man, that's a great one. Philippians four nineteen. Yeah, you know, I, I I leave all those things behind and press forward for the high call of God. Love it. Yeah. Favorite city to visit? No, a great one. Oh, God. Favorite city to visit, man. L A. L A. Are you Not a- Louisiana? <laughs> <laughs> Are you a sweet or salty guy? All day long. I want some sweets right now. Salty. Who likes uh, salty? Like what I person, feel you there. I'm saying that. Like, like <laughs> salty. Like, <laughs> what activity do you like to do the most with your kids? I don't need my son to play football. That's it. Yeah, I don't even play with the girls. Y'all go sit down somewhere. Like, no. Y'all, y'all chilly, okay? And, and, and Brave tries to get in a little bit, can't get in yet. But Canada, he, he wants me to throw him the ball. He wants to play wide receiver and safety. So we football all day. Any any plays chess, but he beats me. Like, he's a five, six year old. Like he goes to school down the street, bro. I don't know what these people teaching these kids in Georgia. Like he plays chess. Like I'm like, chess? Canada, what are you yeah. talking about? He's like, no, he's six years old. He's like, Rook. Hey, dad, move the rook right. I'm like, what you, what is a rook? A rook? Like, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Football and chess. You got, you got the next chess champion in. Yeah. Your favorite worship song? Favorite worship song. Man, it's an oldie but goodie to me. Oceans? I like Oceans. A hill song. Love it. Um, and then last, how can we pray for you, your family, your church? Yeah. Wisdom. You know, my, my, my biggest thing is that, um, you know, I always ask for wisdom, you know. You know, I always ask for wisdom. So you guys can pray for us, you know, not resources, but wisdom, because I would hate to have resources and not have the wisdom to steward them. Yeah. You know, I would hate to have all the influence and not have the wisdom to steward it. You know, so I, I would really love wisdom. I would hate to have the power of God that happens in living land where people get transformed. But I don't even have I don't even have the wisdom to just, you know, know how to move the church and know what's next. So just wisdom, 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 wisdom. That's the eye of the mind. Part being like, well, I'm going to pray that over you, and uh, as we wrap up, but also uh, just want you mentioned that you liked basketball, and uh, my okay. wife is a big basketball fan, and anybody who knows Mayo, he has quite the style, and I, I think that probably comes from his love for basketball because if anybody knows sports, uh, NBA is definitely uh, yeah. way more style than than the, than football players. So he. he <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you. Father God, I thank you so much for Mayo. I thank you for he and his wife, Kaya, and their their three little ones. I thank you, Lord, for how you're using them in the city of Atlanta to make much of you, to share their story of redemption. What a beautiful picture that is. We thank you, Father, that we can experience that uh, amazing transformation in our life. We don't have to go back. We can go forward. We can be people of integrity. We can be walk in the freedom you've you've given us. And I thank you that you have um, given them such a a powerful ministry there in Atlanta. I pray, Lord God, for your wisdom. You would give them discernment. You would guide and direct your steps, show them how to love the people well, the, the ministries they're to be involved with, the connections they're supposed to make. I pray, Father God, that you would just draw people to them through conversations. I pray that people would show up in their services that have no reason, no, no understanding as to why they're even there, but you're doing such a work drawing them. I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do and how you're going to use them in the city of Atlanta to change and transform it. Lord God, I pray that you for all the other churches of the city, Lord, that there might be unity. There might be a heart to make much of you and to spread your fame, your glory, your goodness. And people would see that their life can be forever changed because of what Jesus has done in them. Thank you for Mayo. Thank you for his story. Thank you for his life. Continue to protect him, protect his family, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you so much. Love you, brother. So glad to have you on the show. Thank you so much. God bless you guys.